All right. Okay then. So let's uh, step a little bit back. Yesterday we had basically a, a, a technology back talk about what kind of lab protocols are used, or what kind of lab techniques uh, used in the lab in order to, to uh, purify or study proteins in general. Okay, and we uh, we covered dialysis and we covered uh, let's see, we covered three types of chromatography, uh, germ filtration, ion exchange, and affinity. We also covered electrophoresis, SDS, uh, and we covered isoelectric focusing. Uh, ELISA, we talked about ELISA, and we talked about the Western block, which is also called the Uniblock because it uh, necessitates the uh, use of uh, an antibody that started the next factor. And we talked about it in general. Of course, we also talked about protein digestion. We mentioned that there are three uh, that uh, there are three uh, enzymes that we need to memorize what is what uh, the specificities are for those as far as English protein. Now, Edmund degradation. We talked about protein sequencing, and that's called Edmund degradation. There are many other methods, but we just mentioned that in in, uh, in passing, as uh, in passing, we are using a chemical called uh, phenyl thioisocyanate uh, that links to the N terminal amino acid and flips it off, and then we can identify that amino acid one at a time. We mentioned that it is sensitive for about 50 amino acids or so, uh, and, and that's really pretty much what we talked about as far as in the mutation goes. Okay, those are the three uh, enzymes that I want to do. Right, as far as how they digest, how they kill the protein into uh, different pieces. Uh, and then, and then we have a different question. Okay, so let's see. This is the type of the questions that you can get from those digestion. Here is an enzyme that is trypsin that is subject, this peptide is subjected to. What kind of products we will get? Okay, so of course, feel free to consult your things. Here, I'm going now we are going to talk about our second macromolecule. We are covering macromolecules. We started with proteins, all right? We are now to DNA. And then we still will have uh, talk, talk about carbohydrates and lipids before we move into the core of this course, which is, which is uh, metabolism. So DNA, which really should be the beginning, because really from DNA you get protein, but we figured that protein would be the good middle ground because then we can uh, at least from experience, they get easily easier to DNA. So nucleotides, nucleic acids, really, what we can talk about DNA and RNA, and that's uh, and be mostly from chapter four. There will be other stuff from. Okay, so let's talk about the basics of nucleic acids. Okay, uh, the DNA or RNA, they have ribose. Ribose, it's a five-member uh, uh, sugar. Okay, it's a pentamen, and here is it. Here it is. That's a regular ribose. So we need to know the structure of ribose. As a matter of fact, we will see ribose a lot this semester in metabolism, and and uh, and we need to know exactly the structure. So this is the structure of ribose: one, two, three, four, and five carbons. All right. Notice, of course, the OHs or the hydroxyl groups. Here. Now DNA, it's called deoxy ribonucleic acid, and the reason it's deoxyribonucleic acid because carbon number two lacks the uh, hydroxy group, and hence it doesn't have the oxy, deoxy ribonucleic acid. Also notice that the ribose and sugar, the carbons, are numbered as one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, you know, one over there, and five prime. Okay, so that's basically one of the main differences between DNA, deoxy ribonucleic acid, and RNA, or ribonucleic acid, which is RNA utilizes ribose, and DNA utilizes just ribose. Okay? And this incidentally happened to be why DNA is more stable uh, than RNA, because this OH is reactive, more reactive than just having hydrogen, and so RNA can be degraded easier and faster. All right, so that's that now, the backbone of DNA, the 
which is the strands, the two anti-cardial strands, those are ribose with phosphate. Those are ribose linked together with phosphates. Phosphates and phosphates with the PO4. Okay? And the way it works is that when carbon number 5 prime, which is 5 prime in ribose, is linked to the carbon number 3 prime of the next one, you can see here, let's focus on this red one, red one, and link it to that one in black on top of it. And so carbon number 5 prime is linked to carbon number 3 prime of the next ribose through a phosphate group. Okay? Through a phosphate group. 5 is linked to 3. The result of this is going to have some sort of polarity in the strand. And also note that this phosphate group is negatively charged, the one that's between the two ribos. And hence, DNA under uh, physiological conditions is negatively charged. Okay? Because of that phosphate group. So we have always uh, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, and that is our strand. Now, Carbon number one, the one that's boxed here, that's the carbon that's linked to the nitrogenous base. That's the one that's linked to the actual base that gives the biological information, eventually protein and other stuff. Okay? So five and three are involved in linking the strand through a phosphate to the leader, and nitrogen and carbon number one prime is the one with the nitrogenous base. What kind of nitrogenous bases we're talking about? We have five main nitrogenous bases. We will actually be exposed to more than five later this semester when we talk about nuclear uh, plant batteries. But we have five. Four of them belong to the DNA, and other four belong to the RNA. So there's obviously an overlap. Now, uracil is reserved for RNA, usually, and so we're going to not talk about it for now. We're going to talk about those four nucleotides, the ones that are in DNA. Then we need to know the structures of the four nucleotides. Actually, the five nucleotides, including the one that you don't see right now. So two of them are derived from purine. This is a purine. This is the mother compound, so to speak. And again, in the series, you see that. And so two of them are derived from there, and two of them, as far as DNA goes, are derived from the pyrimidine. Okay? So if you know the structure of pyrimidine and purine, the structures of pyrimidine and purine, then you can easily see how uh, the other uh, nuclear that are derived from the nucleotide. So purines, we call them purines, those are the big ones, adenine and guanine. Okay? Notice adenine has this amino group here, and guanine has an amino group here and a ketone oxygen. So, yeah. So those are the purines. Pyrimidines, the smaller ones, are cytosine and thymine. Cytosine and thymine. Now, I'm, I'm sure at least most of you kind of know that those pair together in a very specific way. Adenine only pairs with thymine, and guanine always pairs with uh, cytosine. So let's look at how the nitrogenous base is attached to the sugar phosphate backbone, and that's the carbon number one prime of the sugar. And this is a pyrimidine, it's an so purine, it's attached to carbon number one through that nitrogen number nine here. And you can see how the nitrogen space is. Now, in reality, because this ribose is linked to that ribose below and ribose above it, this would be our strand here. Right? This would be our strand. So this nucleotide actually is to the other side, because here on the other side here, the whole, there will be the second strand where it has the counter or the complementary nucleotide. And those atoms, the two, the one nitrogen and the one, uh, I mean, sorry, those two nitrogens and one carbon, those two nitrogens and one carbon, will be involved in hydrogen bonding with the complementary atoms, uh, complementary base. Okay? So those would be involved with the nitrogenous, or with the hydrogen bonds. The one with the big ring in the purines. All right, so now if you look at it this way, we have our phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar backbone, and we're talking about only one strand right now. Phosphate, sugar, phosphate, yes ma'am? Sorry, why is that, you have the two 
Why, why is it flipped? Would the six-ring... Uh, well, well, if it's not flipped, it will be to the inside. Those those bases will be to, the, to, the, to this side. We want them to be facing this side, the other strand. Uh, okay. That's why it's just a way of demonstrating. Okay. So we have our phosphate, true to phosphate backbone. All right. And notice that in this stretch here, we have the end of this particular stretch ends at the five prime carbon, the five prime phosphate, and on the other side it ends with the three prime hydroxyl, and hence it's polar as a direction. It's just like the uh, proteins, they always go from N to C. The same thing with nucleotides, they always go from five to three, go from five prime to three prime, or to be more exact, from five prime phosphate to three prime hydroxyl. This is the, the directionality of DNA. So if I give you a sequence, ACC, GCT, et cetera, you will always assume that the first base actually is at the five prime and the last base at the three prime. Not only this, you always have to report your answers when it comes to the device as five to three. Always you have to report them five to three. All right, so this is the five to three strand, and here are the bases, and they're facing the other one, five uh, phosphate, three phosphate, that's the direction. The other strand will actually come from the opposite way, from five to three, this way. Okay? And if it doesn't do this, then we're not going to have a regularly shaped helix or DNA. It will be actually bulging and, and you know, going back and forth. Here, this will make it a perfect cylinder. And you can see now the bases here. They are actually matching each other. You can see cytosine with guanine. You can see here uh, guanine, cytosine, and iodine, and thiamine. Okay? They are paired. And if, if they will never not pair. If they don't pair, if you force this, for example, here, you will have a bulge in the DNA. And that biological system, which is that all the DNA protein that's responsible for maintaining the DNA, will immediately notice that and know that there's a mistake there and chop it off in you know, order to fix it. Okay? So, that we have a way to repair an error if that happens, say if you take it. Okay? Same thing if you force two small ones together, then you're going to have a little indentation like this, and again, the system will notice it. If you put force one in with five in, the same thing, there will be a slight irregularity in the shape that will be noticed by the repair system, which we're not going to be talking about, but the repair system that fixes the DNA all the time. Okay. So this is how they pair, and of course, since you uh, know and memorize the bases, you will also memorize how they pair together. Okay? So you can see, of course, guanine and cytosine, or G and C, let's say G and C from now on, they are uh, paired through three hydrogen bonds, while adenine and thymine are paired through two hydrogen bonds. Okay? So this, conceptually, the AT bond is conceptually weaker than the GC. As a matter of fact, if we have a DNA, DNA that is GC rich, that has more GC, it's harder to separate the strands from each other. And we will see that actually to do anything that makes sense with the DNA, we have to separate the strands from each other in order to read the sequence, to get a protein, or to do some other regular one. All right? So GC DNA is, is more stable, it's harder to, to separate from each other. Okay. Now, the building block of DNA, the building block of proteins, are amino acids. The building block of DNA are nucleotides. So these are the substrates that the, the enzyme that build DNA go DNA will erase with the The enzyme need in order to basically put them together as one DNA molecule. Okay? So this is called, in its entirety, it's called the nucleotide. Okay? So it's called adenosine in this case. And you see nucleotide. Okay. And notice the nucleotide is composed of a sugar, all right, and the nitrogenous base, and three phosphate groups that are sterified to power number five alpha, beta, gamma. Gamma is the uh, last one. Okay, and here is, of course, this is another nucleotide, it's called deoxy nucleotide because notice in carbon number two we have an H instead of OH. Okay, so for DNA to build it, the building block is deoxy nucleotide. For RNA, the building block are nucleotides, or viral nucleotides, sometimes. 
By the way, those are extremely important because they provide us with energy for the ground music, like ATP, for example, and for the other that. So, all right. Now, a nucleoside, a nucleoside, and this is just semantics, okay? <laughs> a nucleoside is actually the base for the ribose. No fossils. That's called the nucleoside. Okay? And again, this is just, you know, uh, terminology. All right. So when we build DNA, when the uh, cell will make a DNA, the cell comes with the DNA in the body, and what it needs to do is replicate that DNA. Replicate means duplicating the DNA. And in order to do that, it has to separate the two strands from each other and build another replica on each one of the strands. So let's consider the strand, and this is the strand that we built. The one very important thing to notice, the many things to notice, but one very important thing to notice is that the building of the DNA of any nucleotide, how we say that, it has it always from 5 to 3 by the So everything is built from 5 to 3, just like proteins are always built or translated from the internal to the sequence. Okay? So this is our base. Or rather, our nucleotide, or the oxygen nucleotide, comes in, and DNA polymerase is the enzyme that does it. Again, it's called DNA polymerase because the DNA itself is a polymer of all those nucleotides, right? And so DNA polymerase, it polymerizes DNA, it makes a polymer. And of course, all the enzymes, as I'm sure most of you know, has an ASE A -S -E at the end of their names. So DNA polymerase will take that and basically stick it here. And the way it knows that it's the right nucleotide, or right nucleotide, is because it complements it perfectly and it fits with that general shape. Uh, and it can detect that it's not the right one and it will take it off if it's not the right one. So, by base complementation, it will put the right base in, and this reaction will produce pyrophosphate. So, it will clip the phosphate right here and uses the alpha phosphate in order to generate that bridge. The alpha phosphate is involved in generating the bridge between the two uh, ribosomes, And these two phosphates will come out together as pyrophosphate. Okay? Or in our again, well, pyrophosphate. Okay, pyrophosphate is basically two phosphates linked together through oxygen. Okay? So this then the pyrophosphate is broken further into two phosphates, two inorganic phosphates. And the enzyme that does this is called pyrophosphatase. Pyrophosphatase. As a matter of fact, this is a very important step because this breaking of the pyrophosphate into two phosphates will allow the reaction chemically to go forward. Okay? Because you're taking something out from the product and hence you are making the reaction more favorable to go forward. Okay, so here's the sequence, and notice you don't have to put the 5 and the 3 and the ends, because you immediately assume it's 5 and 3. Okay? And that's actually one of the tricks in questions like these, is when you report your answer, you also have to report it as 5 to 3. So that's for the complement of this, you naturally get a complement, but you're going to have to report it as 5 to 3 because that anti parallel strand is also 5 to 3. Okay, that is very cool. Yeah, this is a building. Okay, so let's let's just look uh, briefly at the double-stranded DNA. It's obviously a very good molecule. It's a perfect cylinder, uh, and you can see here that there are two grooves. There is one major groove, and there is a minor groove. And so those grooves are used by proteins in order to scan the DNA for whatever function they do. Okay. There are special folds of DNA, like we've seen uh, in the previous lectures, like uh, helix, third helix motif, that will fit here and here and slide, so to speak, glide over that DNA track. Now, those major grooves, if you notice, you can see actually the bases a little bit easier. And it's said that the proteins that liberally read the sequence of the DNA can recognize it, and hence they can read it and recognize certain uh, sequences. 
Okay. Of course, I, I don't care about the uh, rise and all that kind of numbers, but you need to know that those two strands are anti parallel with each other. That those bases are very stacked. So really, the bases cannot read the, or cannot absorb light very efficiently when they are in double strand. So they will still absorb it, but not efficiently. I'm sure when the DNA denatures into two single-stranded, that UV light will have better access to each basis. So you will have a higher reading. Hence, we can see DNA is not good enough. So if you look at the spectrum of a regular double-stranded DNA and you scan to the UV light, uh, and you'll see that okay, the absorbance will peak at 260, you have a DNA there. But now if you heat up this DNA in order to break those hydrogen bonds and separate the two strands from each other, you will have a much higher reading. Okay? Now, if you compare those two, you will immediately know that the DNA quote unquote melted. Melting your DNA is separating the two strands from each other. And hence you will get a higher UV light. A higher reading uh, absorbance from the DNA. Okay? Now the shape of the DNA itself, we always see in more of the most of the publication, the B form of the DNA. There are actually so many other forms. Because you can twist it tighter and have it a, a shorter kind of DNA. You can twist it the other way instead of right-handedness to uh, left-handedness. And all those structures actually exist within a chromosome, within the genome. Uh, at the beginning, we didn't know exactly what they do, but now we think those different structures have regulatory functions, sort of like the signs for other proteins to know that there's something else going to happen. Here. So they have they have a reason to be there. But nevertheless, those three structures have been crystallized, and we know they actually exist. But the default form that we all are familiar with is the B. Okay. Now. We have something called hyperchromism, of course, is when we notice the shift in the DNA. If you were to put the DNA in, a, in a, some sort of cuvette in, in an oven, and you measure the absorbance, the relative absorbance at 260, and you increase the temperature gradually, what you will expect is that the absorbance at 260 will increase, 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 eventually to plateau. Okay? Because the two strands are separated from each other as a different piece with metal. Right? Now, midway through this linear part where it's uh, uh, going up uh, fast, midway is the melting temperature. So you take it there and you have the melting temperature. The melting temperature of the DNA is basically the temperature at which half of the DNA is melting. <coughs> or half of the molecules are melting. If that's a melting point. Now, would you think that it has anything to do with the GC content? If we have a higher GC, if the DNA has a higher GC, the melting temperature would be higher. We need more energy to separate. It's, it's eight meters per week. Uh, as a matter of fact, we can estimate this formula. There are formulas out there to link the melting temperature to the content of the GC. We can estimate the content of the GC. Of course, you know that GC, you don't need to know that GC. Okay, but there are, of course, are first. That's what hyperchromism. Okay? Because all of a sudden it absorbs more DNA and more light as it melts. Hyperchromism. All right. Let's see here. Now, the two single stranded DNA getting together and, and, and binding, we call this hybridization. Okay? I say binding through hydrogen bonds, but this is called hybridization. We can actually use this very uh, feature that the DNA has, the two single strand DNA attached to each other, to approximate or to estimate how close, let's say, two bacterial species are to each other. Okay? If they're close, they have a very close sequence, they will actually hybridize nicely. And we can link that through simply taking the DNA from organism number one, taking the DNA from organism number two, right? And then melting both of them and then taking single strand from here and single strand from here, and then evaluate how much they hybridize. Okay. And so if they hybridize completely, they have the same original melting temperature, say, then they're of the same organism. If they have different melting temperature, depending on how much the melting temperature differs, then we have, you know, 
different relativity between those two problems. But anyway, what I want to say here is that hybridization is one way to evaluate, quote unquote, evolution between different organisms and those two. All right. So let's have our simple question. Remember the fact to three rule. What is the complementary, correct complementary sequence of this? And always remember the five to three. All right. Ah, another comment. Okay. What is the temperature at which half of the DNA helical characteristic or characters is lost? What is that referred to? All right. DNA topology. Now, the chromosome itself, of course, which has basically thousands and thousands and millions of loads of bases, I can actually <coughs> can visualize this as one very long loop, right, or two loops intertwined. And so you can have it <coughs> as a circular in bacteria, it's a circle uh, chromosome, and then you can actually even twist more. Now, imagine, imagine a strand of DNA in a bacteria. Okay? The strand is, is many orders of magnitude longer than the bacteria that, that contains it. So the DNA molecule has to be folded. The same thing with our DNA, actually. You know, we have this very long strand that is actually lengthwise, it is estimated that you can go many times between Earth and the Moon as far as if you extend the DNA. But yet, somehow, this is all compacted in our cells. Why? Because it's folded, and it's folded very deep. As a matter of fact, our proteins, their sole job is to fold DNA and maintain it in a very compact zip, quote unquote, form. That's right. And that is one of the most incredible things because when a cell needs a protein, somehow it has to unfold a region of that DNA that happened to have this gene in order to express it. And so we have different kinds of uh, superchloroquine, if you will. We have positive superchloroquine. And we have negative supercoding depending on the left handedness and right handedness. And each one has its reasons inside the cell. One of them actually becomes like a spring and provides energy in order to uh, uh, unwrap it later. And one of them actually can just be, you know, the idea is just to compress it and fold it in. So I need you to know that DNA is always compressed inside the cell. It's and here's an electron scanning electron micrograph of the DNA in two different forms. Here it's extended as a circle, and here it's actually twisted against each other, smaller. That's right. Now, the DNA molecule, the single stranded part of it, okay, can have what we call self complementation. Self complementation. That means within this strand, Within a single strand cell, there are bases that complement each other that you can simply take it and fold that together and make what we call a hairpin loop. A hairpin loop. You can see here this is extending, and part of it here is complementary. Why this part is not complementary? I make this bubble. Okay, and hence the hairpin loop. This is this will be the loop. And so that stem of the loop, depending on if it's GC rich. And then how long that stem is, of course, that gives characteristic space. Now, the, it's all in the people. But both DNA and RNA can sometimes have those stem, those, those definite. Okay? Those are actually very important structures that they don't form randomly. They have a reason, they have regulatory reasons, and, and many other sides of uh, their signaling uh, pathway. All right, so how does it replicate? It does seem how does it replicate. I mean, uh, replication or duplication of the nucleic acid always leaves the DNA template. You need a primer. You need a primer. In other words, something is stretch that you will start on. You cannot just build DNA from scratch just by taking ACPs and hooking up together. You have to build it over something that's already built. It's more stretch or a primer. And then, of course, we definitely need to be able to repair the mistake because we're doing this extremely fast. Thousands and some of them tens of thousands of bases a second running them. So you're bound to have a mistake every now and then. And actually, the, the, the fidelity is incredible. You know, if you have one every 10,000 base, that's, that's maybe doesn't look like much, but over a million bases or so, that's all the mistakes that can actually be possible. So we need to be able that replication machinery, whatever duplicates the DNA, needs to immediately know that there's a wrong base appropriate. 
Uh, of course, you always need your substrate, the deoxy nucleoside triphosphate, the deoxy nucleoside, and we need usually a divalent ion. That's magnesium or manganese. Yes, okay? you'll know about those and, and methods of studying uh, for this. Okay? All right, and of course, remember that building the DNA always happens from five to three. Okay? So here's the DNA, and here is the primer. So you always have to have a primer. As a matter of fact, the enzyme that makes a primer usually during replication is called primase. Primase. Okay? And you basically build this short stretch here, and then DNA polymerase will carry on and start doing this. And as it's putting those bases, if there's a mistake, it has to go back one base, clip this off, and then allow the right base to go and continue. Okay, so, so it has to go back and forth. All right. Of course, molecular biology is one excellent course that offered in this, uh, in, uh, in, uh, this campus uh, that will tell you all the details of this incredible, incredibly elegant course. All right. Is DNA universal? Every life form has DNA or has nucleic acid? Nucleic acid, yes, at least all in all. Okay? DNA, not necessarily. Not every living organism has uh, a DNA. All right? For example, this tobacco mosaic virus has an RNA as its genome. Okay? And so this RNA eventually becomes a DNA somewhere, and that is then utilized uh, by the virus. And it's always coded with a protein, solid protein that protects the RNA, because the RNA is very fragile. So the virus needs to carry it. We have also retroviruses. Retroviruses such as the HIV, the one that's associated with AIDS, that virus also has an RNA. And the way it does, it can build DNA out of the RNA. So it will replicate, or rather reverse transcribe, I'll talk about that in a little bit, the RNA into a DNA. And then that DNA is integrated in our DNA, and hence it manifests the disease eventually. But that's called the retrovirus. The retrovirus is a virus that has an RNA, as you know, and reverse transcribe it to RNA. Okay, of course, I would like to remind you that we have two kinds of cells, a prokaryote and a eukaryote, right? A prokaryote are cells that don't have a, a, a nucleus, right? So the DNA has maybe a nucleus zone, but not a nucleus. While eukaryotes have, of course, a nucleus where the DNA is stored inside. Okay? As a matter of fact, the mitochondria and the eukaryotes is about the size of the bacteria. So they are much bigger cells. Okay, so just a reminder, because it will help us to talk about transcription very, very big Okay, now to the RNA, the right one to take acid. And here we have, of course, four bases. Now we don't have the thymine, so we're going to cover that. We have uracil instead of thymine. So we have a U instead of T. And the same thing goes U bonds with A and C binds with G. Okay? RNA, it's a single strand, uh, is not blue, so that means it can actually uh, form many seemingly random structures. It's not a double strand, it's not blue. And so, uh, we have many, many types of RNA. We have three major types, and then we have many other types that we are just beginning to unravel. Okay? This is one type here, it's called transfer RNA. And it's transfer RNA because it transfers amino acids during the uh, translation process, during the protein synthesis process. All right? And notice that this is a single stranded RNA that's folded together in this form. And you can see here that hydrogen bonds between the complement. So we have herpin loop here, herpin loop here, herpin loop here. Okay. Now, that, tra that translation itself, of course, involves three kinds of major RNAs. One of them is called ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. And that is, of course, the majority of the RNA. And that makes the ribosome. That's the big machine that actually builds the protein. The cyber protein are built or translated is the accurate uh, uh, description. And then we have the transfer RNAs, the one that carry the amino acids that will be blocked for the, uh, for the protein. And then we have a messenger RNA or message uh, mRNA. And that's the one that actually carries the information 
for building the protein. That's the genetic code that also we'll be talking about in a little bit. Okay? So those three major RNAs come together in order to build a protein. Because we are dealing now with two different languages. That's what we call the translation part. The language of amino acids that we see, and the language, of course, of the four nucleotides that somehow we need to translate it. And this is the translation machine. That's why we call it protein synthesis, protein translation. Okay, this, by the way, here, this one, is one of the ribosomal RNAs that's folded this way. We talked about it uh, earlier. And you can see those many loops here and many complementation. And the correct folding is absolutely essential for the healthy ribosome to work. All right, so those are the major RNAs. Ribosomal RNA, transfer RNA, or mesenchymal RNA. They, they really comprise the majority. But there are other RNAs. There are regulatory RNAs. My RNA, thy RNA, pi RNA, exist RNA, CRISPR RNA, riboswitches, antisense RNA, you name it. Because really, we can only translate into protein about 3% of our genetic code. The rest is, they used to call it junk DNA, but it's really DNA that has a lot of regulatory function, including that uh, coding for RNA. And each one of those RNAs, as we'll see in the next slide, is responsible for some regulatory process. Okay? It's beyond the scope of this course, but at least I want you to be aware that we have a regulatory type RNA. Exist RNA, for example, is very interesting, because it's a, an RNA that codes the X chromosome. Okay? The X chromosome. And hence, it activates randomly parts of that chromosome. It doesn't allow it to produce proteins. The result of this, one of the results of this, is pentotets. It goes random patterns on it. Actually, it's, it's incredible because that randomness gives me this random uh, uh, spots on the cat. And there's a famous case uh, in a, one of those companies that clone your pet where somebody's cat had died. And so he provided them with DNA to clone it. He loved it very much. And so they cloned it. But they have the DNA, but they really don't know the pattern. Nobody knows the pattern of that X chromosome being activated. So they got a different looking cat. Genomically, genetically, it's the same cat. But it just looked different. And there was a lawsuit in this, and I don't know where it ended. <laughs> anyway, but basically, this randomness will not allow you to have the same pattern, if you know it. So it's not just a DNA sequence that gives you that, there's some other item there. RNA processing. All right, we'll see some of that today, and they're very briefly, like splicing, and, and uh, actually, splicing is the one that we have added. But there are some other guided processes where uh, RNA. Space. And then, of course, the genome itself, as we've seen in the development back right, and RNA. And this slide is just meant to tell you about some of those functions of those RNAs. Okay? All right. So, RNA, just like DNA, it has to be transcribed, it has to be synthesized. The difference between it and the DNA is that it doesn't need a primer. You simply need the DNA as your template, you still need the magnesium and manganese. And of course, instead of rival nucleotides, you have the oxygen uh, rival nucleotides, you need to nucleotide. And again, it's five to three. Again, it's five to three. And as a matter of fact, for the time we call this process transcription, not representation, transcription. Uh, we really don't care about error repair. Okay? We might very well have a defective RNA. Why we don't care? Because we have the actual DNA, the actual book that's been proofread so many times. So if one RNA is bad, we can always go back to the DNA and make more. That's easy. Replicating DNA and making sure that's accurate, that requires a lot of stuff. Another thing about transcription that I want to also briefly mention, that, let's say for proteins, those proteins are coded on that DNA, how does the RNA equilibrate, and that's the name of the enzyme that makes RNA, RNA equilibrate, how does it know where the beginning of the gene is? Okay. And so there are several maps, road maps, or road signs, if you will, on the DNA that will tell RNA polymerase where the first gene is, or where the first base of the DNA is. But otherwise, you're looking at just a bunch of letters, and there is no way you can know. And so, just as a way of introduction, usually bacteria have uh, what we call uh, specific sequences, regulatory sequences. One of all is called triple box and minus 35 region. Those are just the approximate positions. 
for those. And those are sequences that somehow RNA polymerase machinery, which is involved in different enzymes, can recognize. And eukaryotes have something called catabax and the cat box, and, and there are numerous other kind of. Uh, I just want you to, to know conceptually that if the green here is the beginning of the gene, usually we have different road signs that can actually extend all the way back several thousands of places. And somehow this transcription machinery can read all that stuff and position itself exactly at nucleotide number one for that gene. This is very, very important. Again, if that doesn't in life from existing. And same thing, the end of the DNA replication usually is the end of the DNA molecule. For the RNA, you know, you have the world ahead, when to know how to stop, or when to know where to stop. And so we have some people transcription termination, transcription termination. And one of those things that aid in transcription termination is the formation of those peptin loops we talked about earlier. There are many other forms, but again, eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Again. The eukaryotes, once they build the RNA, immediately the ribosomes can hop on and make proteins. And the eukaryotes, they can't, because we build an immature RNA that has some interferences. Okay, so this is a cartoon representation of a premature RNA from, from a eukaryote. The blue boxes represent what we call exons, and the red boxes are basically intron, intervening sequences. And so after the premature RNA is produced, muscular RNA, then it has to be spliced. It has to be actually, these things have to be removed and then put together as mature messenger RNA that's ready for transcription, for translation. Okay? So this is called splicing. This is called splicing. Of course, there's something called alternative splicing. Again, it can get very uh, personal afterwards. But, but for now, we need to know that an RNA and a eukaryotes, messenger RNA and eukaryotes is processed. And hence, it's not coupled. So in eukaryotes, you get your premature RNA that has to be processed to RNA, getting out of the nucleus where the ribosomes can then build it. In eukaryotes, the transcription is coupled, we call it coupled with translation, because as the RNA number is translating the RNA, ribosomes can immediately start building the protein as long as they have uh, you know, access to it. Okay, so the transcription translation is coupled in prokaryotes, while in eukaryotes, it's uncoupled. It's separate processes by space. So the protein, the protein, the amino acid itself, is attached to the three prime end of the, uh, of the transfer RNA. And notice here we have something called anticodon, and this is what I want to talk about next, which is basically the, the uh, dictionary that uh, uh, basically consolidate both the amino acid and the nucleotide language. And then, of course, we have these various loops that can be used to recognize the different amino acids, since we have amino acids. So, a genetic code is what I'm going to talk about next. There are rules for it. Each amino acid, as you might know, as you probably know, has three bases that codes for it. Okay? Each amino acid has three bases. And if you look at the entire combination of the ACGT and three bases, you would have 64 possibilities. So obviously you have more, if I'm speaking, I'm so sorry, because I tend to spit. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so the genetic code, hence, uh, we have more codons than we have amino acids. So naturally, you would believe that there are several amino acids per, I mean, several codons per amino acid, and we'll see that. Okay. So the other thing is, because it's three at a time, then we would expect that the translation machinery would be reading those messages in the messenger RNA three bases at a time to allow the, trans, uh, the transfer RNA to come in. And hence, we have what we call open reading frame. Okay? A reading frame is basically a frame where you translate the uh, DNA to protein. And usually, the ribosome will know exactly which three to pop, three after three after three. And it happens like this. It never happens like this where you go A, U, G, G, U, G, and then you go back one base and you start again. It's always three consecutive bases. All right? And that's amazing because you have to, I mean, you have just the letters, and somehow you have to put yourself in frame 
and move three days a week. And so, just to show you that this is very important, if you look at these bases here, okay, and here is the translation of this three at a time, starting from the first one, 30, 30, 16, etc. If you were to skip a base and start from here, notice that you have totally nothing, you have totally different amino acid sequence. If that happens, then you have totally different protein, and then, you know, it might have bad consequences. If you skip yet another base, then you're going to go arginine, rosine, and then look at that. That is actually called the stop coda. So you'll have protein that stops. Of course, not to mention that this is the wrong protein in the first place. And so we have three reading frames per strand. Since DNA is two strands, it looks like we have six reading frames, three per strand. It goes against you. Because if you skip one more, then you're back in the first frame. So this is very Oh, okay, so let's, let's answer this first. The protein translation, a real frame, refers to what? Oh, what a time. Three times. All right, let's, let's answer this in third. All right, so now here, I don't want you to memorize anything. Okay? I just want to talk about the genetic code. That's all what I want to talk about. Because it's amazing. We have 64 possibilities that actually code for those 20 amino acids. Okay, so I just want to define for you uh, the only thing I want you to know about the genetic code that it's degenerate. Okay, degenerate that means uh, there is some flexibility in the last base in the code. These are all the 64 possibilities, and notice that three of those are dedicated for a stop cell to tell the ribosome that the protein is finished. We finish synthesis for translating that protein. Three of them, UAA, UAG, and UGA. You do not need to memorize that. The rest is for the amino acid. You can see here proline as UUU and UUC. Of course, we're talking about DNA, it's TPC or DPP. And then Lucy, etc., etc. Okay? Now, not all this 64 minus 3, 61, are not divided equally by amino acids. Actually, there is an amino acid here, or a couple of amino acids here, that have only one coda, and that's the family and tryptophan. Those two only have one coda. Everybody else has more than one coda. Okay? So let's just take a very brief tour of that genetic code. If you look at the third basis, a mutation in the DNA is basically something that causes the base to change. Okay? To change to something else. That's a mutation. So if you have a mutation in the last base of the codon, then what's going to happen, you're going to end up having a similar amino acid, <clears throat> or what we can call in this course a complementary amino acid. So if you change any of those, notice that you can go from leucine to isoleucine, or to valine. Now what's the common between those amino acids? They are all hydrophobic. So it will not necessarily affect the overall structure of the protein, and you still might have a function of protein. That's amazing, because that predicts us. Same thing here. We go from proline to three amine. They're still <clears throat> semipolar and they can interact with water. STD, good amine. Okay, you have polarity. So it will still maintain maybe partially functional protein, but nevertheless, it will be functional and it will not cause death for them. Now, the first base, if you have mutation of the first base, the same thing. You will actually have a similar amino acid. Because you can U to A, you're going to go from phenylalanine to isoleucine. Both are hydrophobic amino acids. Same result. The middle one, on the other hand, that calls for pyrimidines. Okay? Codons with pyrimidines are put in the second position, mostly hydrophobic. Now let's look at this. Codons with pyrimidines. Pyrimidines are, what are the pyrimidines? Which two bases are the pyrimidines? C and T. So notice here, let's look at C. Uh, T, of course, in RNA is U. All right? So notice here, U and C. Most of them, all the amino acids in those two columns are what? Are hydrophobic amino acids. That's also by design. This way, we can be protected if any mutation happen there. Now, what about the bases that are purines, that are mostly polar amino acids? Mostly polar amino acids, short amino acids. Again, that's what the code. Now, if the first two positions are occupied by G or C, you will always have the same amino acid. 
Then, what are the chances of this? The first two bases are always GNC, then you will always have the same amino acid. Okay? Now, what is this designed to do? It's basically to protect us from all the elements that will actually cause an mutation in those bases. Because you still have a chance to get a partially functional protein, or sometimes the same protein, okay? just because we have mutation. So the genetic code in this dictionary is actually very, very amazing. So now let's end the lecture by talking about the three processes that we very, very, very briefly talked about. First one is replication, okay? And the second one is transcription. Now we very briefly talked about reverse transcription, which is going from RNA to DNA, and that's in HIV, or in what we call uh, retroviruses. All right, and then we have translation, which is building the Okay, so replication, process by which DNA is duplicated. Transcription, RNA is uh, transcribed, reverse transcription, building a DNA from RNA. And of course, translation, building a protein or translating a protein from RNA. Now, these collectively are called gene expression. When we say a gene is expressed, that means a protein was produced from that gene. That means this. This pipeline from replication, or rather from transcription to translation, all continuously produce a protein. Hence, the gene is expressed. We have a protein, we have a phenotype, we have some, something that happened with that gene. And there is a humongous area of study called gene expression, of transcriptomy, which is basically studying the expression of what proteins are produced at any point of time at the cell. All right, next thing we're going to talk about which is after the break, uh, and, and well, probably after the break, let's say after the break, are other tools that we can use in uh, studying DNA. So we did that with proteins. We've seen the chromatography and all that stuff. Here, we're going to cover these different molecular tools that will allow us to manipulate the DNA. All right?